Welcome to the Outlaw Radio Show. My name is Zach Adams. So glad that you're joining me tonight. I pastor a church located just outside of Athens, Georgia. The name of the church is called Calvary 316. If you're local, come hang out with us one Sunday morning. Our service is at 1030. If you're not local, but looking for a good church to maybe check out online, uh, we live stream our service. <clears throat> you can find our live stream at facebook.com slash Calvary 316 or our YouTube channel, which is calvary316.live. So if you're local, come hang out with us one Sunday. If you're not, join us online and, uh, and be blessed by our service. I'm joined in studio, as always, by the man that needs no introduction, Pope Creighton Vaughn. How you doing, Pope Creighton? I am doing well. Uh, it seems I, it feels I like I, I, just, I caught you off guard. Yeah, uh, I think our stream might be having trouble. Vimeo is giving me all kinds of troubles tonight. Um, so I apologize if the stream is jacked up. It'll be on podcast tomorrow, and uh, and if it's too bad, I will re-upload a video. You'll re-up the video. So explain kind of yeah. how the show works for those uh, that might be watching for the first time. So basically what happens is I will ask a question to Zach and the, the group of guys that we have here. Who will be um, introduced momentarily. Yes, they'll be introduced. Um, they don't know what the question is going to be going into it. Um, Zach is going to make it into a Bible study and maybe explain the stuff. Because um, some of the stuff that I bring up is off the wall. Um, and then we will discuss it, and that kind of goes back and forth for about an hour, um, and we have a good time. And it's a madhouse usually. It's just very subdued. It's and what weird. is what is? I know it's a very laid back tonight. Um, what is also fun about the stream itself? So this is a podcast. We are live streaming the recording of a podcast that gets released on Thursdays. Uh, the reason that we live stream it is so that you, the audience, can interact with us. Uh, in real time, again, we might be having some issues with, with the stream. We're not 100% sure. Uh, at the same time, you can drop notes on the comment section. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, at lawradio.live, you can drop comments there. Creighton's monitoring that. Or facebook.com slash theradiooutlaw. You can also leave comments on that thread, uh, which is super cool. You can always email thoughts, questions, whatnot, to our official Outlaw Radio email address, which is popecreighton at gmail.com. Join in studio by uh, the, the, the Mary Band of Brothers. Uh, Nicholas is not with us today, so Vinny's jumping back into the fold. Different chair, moving from the couch <laughs> to a different chair. Uh, no, Vinny, no. Vinny Hines, how you doing, man? Doing good. Good to be here. How's your week going? Fantastic. C- crazy, off the wall? Yes. Understood. Deal Daddy Derek? We're here, baby. I see that you you and Creighton went all corporate on us tonight. <laughs> yeah, man, got to go collars. Got to go C316 yeah. black collars. We're it's all sure. about merch. Yeah. It's all about the merch out, for baby. sure. Hey, did you do you like my shirt? I got this for my birthday. <laughs> World's okay as pastor. Accurate. I'll, thank you, Kyle. <laughs> I will take it. The, I could be. I could have been given a lot worse. Uh, that is for sure. Also joined, we've got uh, Spice Daddy. Daddy. You know, you have a general look to you. It's kind of like, and I say this with respect, like a chubby Indiana Jones. Well, accurate. That's what he was going for. Yeah, I know. I mean, but, yeah, it's not that I'm mean. It's always earth tones. It's not that I mean to, but when you're when when most or half of your life is spent in some outdoor capacity, doing you, what kind of work? Well, whether that be archaeology or summer camps or being a park ranger or, you know, now that I work in a gun store, it, it just kind of... Uh, it's just your look. Works. Yeah, it just it's not that I mean to. It just happens. I'm just not good with bright colors. <laughs> Can you imagine him with some, like, hot pink or something? Salmon. 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 <laughs> Salmon. Yeah. Also join uh, Kyle. How you doing, brother? Howdy. Doing good. So uh, you filled in on Sunday. You taught on Sunday. What did you teach on? Uh, seasons of life. Um, really uh, just digging into something that, you know, everybody experiences and, you know, just figuring out what seasons are for, what their purpose is and, you know. Now you took an them. interesting approach. Like, like how did you approach the? I went into it originally. Um, I got curious just thinking about, you know, when you talk about periods of life and, and things like that. You, a lot of times you hear pastors teach or you'll read things about like how to, how to approach a season, how to go into a season, um, or what to do while you're in it, the kind of attitudes you should have. But there's not a lot that's said about how to finish things strong. And so uh, the whole idea started with just looking at the closing of all of the epistles um, in the New Testament and kind of comparing and contrasting and seeing if there were commonalities or themes. And there's definitely some stuff there. So. Very cool. 
Very cool. So uh, the live stream of that is uh, on their church website. Uh, I believe so. Mm -hmm. uh, Calvary three sixteen dot tv dot com dot org dot net. So I encourage you. It's also you, on the Calvary three sixteen uh, YouTube channel. Also on the YouTube channel. So if you're interested, uh, go check out the archive and be blessed by that study. Um, before we get to uh, your topic, naturally, naturally, um, I you know so I I've been chewing on an idea, and and I think it's kind of a funny idea. I, I'm not really sure. Um, how this really developed. So, so I, I was at, I went to a pastor's conference, the East coast conference a couple weeks ago. And like, there's this, so within Calvary chapel, so Calvary chapel began, uh, pastor Chuck late sixties into the seventies. So you had a lot of, a lot of guys that were getting saved in the seventies, um, as young men. And then they were kind of being trained up whatnot. And then they went out and started churches, uh, maybe the earliest, the late seventies, but into the eighties. So like my dad started a church, uh, in 1980. So, so now here, 2023, um, we, we, that, that group of pastors. So what you would call like first generation Calvary chapel pastors, they're all now in like their seventies, late sixties, 70, some of them early eighties there. So there's this whole big thing about, and, and it was funny. I had one pastor that uh, I was talking to and, uh, and he was like, yeah, we're, we're in the middle of transitioning. Um, uh, I'm handing the church over to my son. And I was like, there has to be a better way to say this, that you're transitioning. Um, you, you are from California. I'm not sure that you're articulating what you're trying to say by saying, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm transitioning. The word's um, a bit muddied now. It is, it is muddled <laughs> for sure. Um, but like the whole idea of the, the, the transitional, like transitioning from one pastor to another because you've gotten old or whatnot or you're wanting to try to reach the next generation. Like, I'm not sure I like really understand this or like get, I, I, I guess I understand the sentiment. Um, but at the same time, it's like, why don't you just keep pastoring? Like, why do you have to transition? Like you're still called, you still got breath. You can still preach. Um, are you struggling because you know, the, there's not, more young people coming into the church. I'm not sure that the solution is for you to quit and hand it over to a younger guy, hoping that you can like, why not just keep going? It leads back to that, that conversation we've had before where it's like, what's wrong with church dot church is dying. Like they have a group of people, a community of people. They have their pastor, their pastor loves them. They love their pastor. They, they, they live life together. The pastor baptizes their kids and, and, and then the grandkids and marries them off. And, and like, they just live this beautiful, temporary life together and then they just die out and a whole nother church comes into into being like like i don't know about like it's funny because my dad we went to a conference years ago and it was about like they had invited a few groups of pastors to kind of speak to this whole idea of transitioning your church from one generation to the next and and they 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 assumed that my dad and i were doing the same thing <laughs> and the funniest part was like, um, no surprise. Like, a, I have no interest in that. Like, I'm doing my own thing, and that dude is gonna die in the pulpit. You know, he'll he'll pastor Calvary Chapel Stone Mountain until he's dead. That's when the transition will happen. You know, because he has a call in his life. Why would why why force him to stop? Now, again, the, the, you, know, you get into certain situations where a pastor is no longer physically able to carry forth the tasks. Um, or his, his mental acumen begins to slip. I think some of the final years of Pastor Chuck was kind of sad because he, he wasn't the same guy. And, and, and yet, that was the decision. He wanted to keep preaching, and the church loved him. And w why did it have to transition? So anyway, I just that's been on my mind. Um, I would love thoughts, feedback, comments. I mean, you guys have anything rough? I know that's an off-the-wall topic. We'll get to what Creighton wants to bring up, but... Um, something I've been thinking about, like what's wrong with just being in the pulpit till you die? I mean, I think is it, is it wrong for a pastor to have an option to want to retire at some point? Like if that's their, that's their work and you know, that's not the main purpose, but like, do you see something wrong in general with pastors thinking about, I'm going to do this until I'm, you know, 70 years old. And then I want to, I want to take my last few light, few years and enjoy it and pass it off to my son. Like, is that, is there no, something wrong I, with that thought process? Listen, I'm not saying that there's anything... Like, this is not a right or wrong. Yeah. 
to me, it's, and this is very true though, is there seems to be like this weird pressure to with, keep up with the generations within the Calvary Chapel movement. And, and particularly because that's all I can speak to yeah. where you have a bunch of older guys that feel a pressure of like, um, I'm not doing a good job reaching the younger generation. Maybe I need to get out. Like this. Well, that's that's God's job, anyways. I think it all comes down to what's the purpose. Like, what's the? Wh- why are you trying to transition? Is it because you're you're trying to do God's work? Like, you're trying to play God and direct things, or are you doing it because you, you know, God's calling you to another portion, another season of life? Yeah, regardless I mean, I agree of who you put in that church, like whatever transition period you decide to do, whatever you guys want to do, and like it's. God, at the end of the day, he's had no problem establishing churches for the past however many years, thousands of years. Well, you know, you bring so, up, Kyle, you bring up an interesting thought about just the retirement angle. Um, I, I think the, 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 the concept of retirement, uh, give me a biblical example of that. Like, uh, give me any precedent in Scripture of, of, like, the substantiation of our Western idea of, hey, you've worked enough. I think they had to get their heads chopped off to get out. I have a hold on. No, I hold don't on think because so. I can't give you any <laughs> biblical definition of dating. No, that doesn't mean that I necessarily right. think we should go back to we'll, we'll arranged marriages. What I think that I think that what you're dealing with is a. I think you should be able to have, if you're a pastor, if you're aging, regardless of the health of your church. Like I think it would be totally normal and like a a normal progression of things if your parents left Stone Mountain and literally just traveled the world teaching and doing nursing stuff. Like that but they, would make but sense they, they wouldn't have retired. I hold on. It depends on how you define retirement. Okay. Well, because in our Western, in our Western see, context, how do we define retirement? And you, do, a, I don't, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to retire. My parents will never retire. So I don't know what you mean by retirement. Well, we, we have think, an idea in America about looks, retirement. Retirement we, looks different for everyone. Everyone's but, retirement is different. I think you can retire. I don't from being like a the idea and of still minister. I don't to like people the all over word the place. retirement. Why? It's a weird semantic. Because kill the, the to word die on. itself implies that you're you're tired and over. Like like that somehow. Like for example, um, and again, I don't want to get into the semantics, and I understand the the consideration of that. But like we do have this idea of like, hey. I've lived my life. I've worked hard. I've raised my kids. I've done, I've done life and now I'm retired. And so now I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm done doing these things. I'm done working. And, and I just want, um, leisure. Um, I want to spend the last 10 years of my life on a golf course or on my boat fishing. Um, I'm, I've worked hard. I've worked long. Now I'm out. Um, there are pastors that approach it the same way. Like, hey, I've done my deal. I've, I've saved up. Now the last few years of my, my life, I'm not in ministry anymore. Um, I, I just don't like, I don't like the whole idea at all. Now, there can be transitions of work. You know, you get, like, you see that within the priesthood. Like, they, mm-hmm. would, they would serve. They had a lot of time that they would serve. And then, but, but they didn't retire. They transitioned to a new season of ministry within a different context. Like what you're describing with my parents, they will, they will, they will continue to minister regardless. Like my dad will not retire. He will never use that word retire because he's not going to stop doing what he's been called to do. He's not retiring from his calling. He's going to continue forth in that calling, even if that calling morphs and changes. Yeah. I think I've seen so many older people that were so involved in church, so involved in ministry. And then like, I don't know if there was like this dynamic where they just didn't feel wanted anymore or cherished, but it was like they got to a point where now they're no longer doing anything with the church. Like I'm retired and like, my, you know, my involvement in church is not the same. My engagement is not like I've, I've retired. I think you're discussing two different things. Yeah. You're not talking about because this. the first thing was a pastor retiring, which I think is fine. Like, Cool. What is that? But define that because I don't find that. Cool. I mean, stepping away from the pulpit, regardless of what they do after they separate the pulpit, I think that is fine. Yeah, you you because actually said at it one be? point in time that you know the pastor's calling, you know, blah blah blah. They're doing their calling and they can't just retire. You know, a calling can change and whatnot. Like ab- absolutely, a calling can change. Where a pastor might at one point in time be pastoring a church and then like 
the calling can, a season of life can change. A calling can change to where like, okay, now I'm going to like, I'm going to pass to the golf club or, you know, no, (laughs) no, like, um, I'm going to fill a role as an elder in the, in the church, like, or, you know, continue in a role like that or move on to traveling ministry or something like that. Like that's absolutely possible. You could still have to fulfill your calling to God, I don't. but it doesn't mean that you're stuck in the, once you commit to the pulpit. I don't think you're retired. Yeah, but once you're once you commit to a pulpit, you're not stuck in the pulpit no, no, for the no. rest of your life. I, and I, I 100% agree with that. But what I'm saying is, you're not retiring. You're moving to a different portion of calling. So it, once now again, it comes to down semantics. to what's I don't the think, reason. I, I don't think it's semantics because I, because I see it. Hold on. Here's and I why think I think that, it's semantics because your second point was something completely different. Your second point was people who you have to speak up. Re, your second point was that people who retire often then become less involved in their church. That's not what either of us are talking about. You're talking about people who, like, quiet quit from a church. You're well, not I'm bro- talking I'm about broadening, retirement. I am broadening the conversation. Yeah. Right, but I still think you're talking about people who quiet quit from a church. Even I think the pastors, pastor, do the, pastors do the same thing. That right? is very different from retirement. I don't think those things are the, two, are the same thing, and I don't think you can conflate them. Because one of them is essentially walking away from a church— you still have to be louder. I can't, I can't hear you. Can you not hear me? I can hear I myself hear very you. well. I can't hear you. He's getting um, close to retirement age. Because so. <laughs> <laughs> one of them is like basically walking away from the church. The other is leaving the pulpit to allow someone else to come up because you, because you no longer want to do it, because you are no longer able to do it. I think those are two very different things. A right and a wrong like, right. reason for it. Like, I, think that, I think it's fine if you want to walk away from the pulpit. And then, you know, still be involved in the church, even if it's in a lesser role than you were as a pastor. I think that's very different is, than is, leaving the church for all intents and purposes is, because pre, you're retired. Is, is pastoral ministry um, rooted in a gift of the Spirit? Yes. Yeah. Does the gift of the Spirit change because you got older? Like, it's an anointing of the Holy Spirit. Does that gift go away? And then, and then if it doesn't, don't you have a responsibility to continue forth— Again, it might look differently, and, and I go back to what Kyle was saying, and I think it's a good point. Like, hey, you might not – preaching is a very small part of what a pastor is. Mm-hmm. And, and I know in our culture we've kind of convoluted that because we've emphasized what happens behind the pulpit as being the, the chief job of a, of a pastor. Uh, preaching is – preaching, teaching is a, is a part of pastoral ministry, but it's only a part of it. So, yeah, can there be a dynamic where – um, listen, man, I went through a season last year <laughs> where, I mean, pastoral ministry changed for me because I couldn't get behind the pulpit. But as soon as I got home, like, I'm still a pastor. Like, and I have a group of people that God has placed into my life and, and I've been placed into their life for me to pastor. I can't get behind the pulpit. I can't physically do that. But I mean, you guys were coming over We and I was, man, I, I went into more FaceTime ministry that I've, you know, that I've ever done. I, I was communicating, talking, pastoral ministry. And again, I would say that if there's an anointing and a call, does that just go away because you reached a certain age? I would say no. Can the context of its application be different? Sure, sure. But I wouldn't call that retirement. I would never use the word retirement. For I you, absolutely you, would. Because See, I wouldn't. Ret- retirement would, okay, so retirement. I wouldn't. Let's, I wouldn't. Use, let's use the Western word, retirement. I'm no longer be- going to be getting a paycheck because I've saved money. You can retire from becoming a pastor when you get old enough to do it. You'll still be pastoring people. You're not going to be getting a paycheck. I That's see, retirement. I, you are retired. Yes. And in I fact, wouldn't. it has a legal definition that I, I, I am now retired, and I can draw on whatever retirement savings that I have. Like, it. this is a very weird semantic <laughs> argument, and I'm very confused by how long it's gone I, I on. I see exactly <laughs> what Zach's getting at. Zach will never retire because Zach has a spiritual calling. Joel Osteen will probably retire. Rick Warren will retire. Well, once again, it's a semantic argument because what you're talking about and what, like, what Joel is seeing, Joel is going to retire. So you're connecting, Joel you're connecting, connecting go employment, <laughs> you're, but you're, you're connecting, like, well, what if, what if I just, what if I won the lotto tomorrow? Would I ever take a paycheck from Calvary 316 again? No. Would I have retired? Not at all. I'd be living off of a retirement fund, whatever that is. So you would be retired. I would not be retired. Le- legally you would. And once no, again, why get back to this legally, is a semantic argument? I wouldn't even argument. legally be retired. Argu- I, I think where you're it's getting a semantic at, argument. you're not, not officially employed by at that point anymore. Which is not retirement. retirement. But I don't think you're ever I think retirement's a mindset. As a pastor, you're 
following your spiritual calling and doing what you are called Hold on. to do. Hold on. But what did just you just say, Zach? I think retirement's a mindset. Say that again. I think retirement's a mindset. Can you not hear me now? So it is a semantic. It's lit. It's literally no. It's a, a mindset. Part. Okay. Uh, let me know when it's my turn, uh, and then I'll come back to the conversation. I'm still well, if it's wondering. a mindset, baby. I'm retired two years ago. So. Well, but that, but then that would I would have a problem with that. Just well, as your brother, like no, I mean, you're Vimeo fight. just crashed. I'm not retiring I'm from the fight. Why Creighton yeah. has gone along with this so long? I don't know. <laughs> I I got great. sucked into it. You did. It was amazing. <laughs> Hook line and sinker. <laughs> Hook line and sinker. You also, guys get uh, Vimeo just crashed, so I think we might be down. <laughs> that that's fine. Well, we'll keep going and just edit the video and post it later, um, which will which will work. If you want to keep working on trying to get it back I up, will. Um, I will. I get what everybody's saying. This is kind Vimeo of Vimeo retired. <laughs> Well, it's not, but to me, get, get back to the, the, um, and we'll riff on this for just another few minutes so Creighton can get this fixed before we introduce the topic. So before we transition, I'll give Creighton a moment here. Um, full circle. Full circle. So I don't think it's, and again, maybe I'm having, we're getting trapped in the, this semantic thing. Get back to the heart of what I'm trying to say. The heart of what I'm trying to say is that like we do have this approach within within our culture um, of I'm retiring from what I've spent my life doing, and now I don't have to do anything anymore. Um, I live on a golf course. I see a lot of them out there. They retire, and guess what? They, they I think it's a wasted it's a waste of years. Now I'm not saying that you can't enjoy certain things and be able to spend time with your wife or, or go visit grandkids that are somewhere else, whatnot. But like this idea, this mindset of like, I'm no longer in a battle. I'm no longer fighting. I'm no longer valuable. My, you know, like within the Christian ideal there, the word retirement, we don't even have retirement in the kingdom because we keep working. Like there's work. The race still and there's, isn't over. There's purpose. There's movement. Now, th that can change the context of what it is, but we do have this idea, just within our society, I've paid my due, I've worked hard, I've done this thing, and now I'm done. And I get to just take it easy now for the next 10, 15 years, however amount of money I have, and I'm out. And I think that that seeps into the way that we often view our, our Christian experience. When we get into elder years... Well, I'm I, I'm I'm not relevant anymore to a younger generation, or I'm not physically able to put in the hours that I used to, or um, I can't do this, or I can't do that, or the songs that I like to sing are old. Like, wait a second. I mean, there's a, I think you know, yeah, the church has racial problems. You know, you, you you drive around town. There's black churches, white churches, Korean churches, Mexican churches. Like we have these this cultural separation in the way that we worship based on race. Martin Luther King said that the most segregated day in America is Sunday morning. Um, and there's a sad truth to that. Um, but I also think what is equally a bummer is that you have this, this uh, generational division within, a church, within churches. You have old churches, you have younger churches. Um, and I think that's such a sad thing. Um, because, because, you know, you have older churches with so much wisdom and no energy. And you get younger churches with so much energy but no wisdom. And like... The, the Bible talks about the old men, you know, ministering and raising up the young men and the older women with the younger women and that there is this beauty within church community. Like there's value. And I, I guess my point is that your, your ministry is not over. Your work is not done. You can't retire as a Christian, whatever secular world that's applicable to whatever. But as a Christian, there is no retirement. You're not taking it easy. The battle doesn't stop. You're in the war. Now, maybe you're not on the front lines and a young man needs to be, you know, doing something. But, like, you have value and purpose. And I just think that, that we, we have this kind of Christian culture where the idea in the West of retirement, you know, you, you, you've never had this before because we've never, just as people, have ever had that luxury. Like, it's been, what, within the last, probably since the 50s that that whole idea has even come to be. You, you're an American in the 30s. You work till you're dead. You know, I, until they started implementing Social Security and even the idea of that. Like, this is a new phenomenon. Generations pass forever. You just, you worked. And you worked, because if you didn't work, you didn't eat. Um, and, then, and then one day you died. 
but the fight you were always you always had this mindset of the fight of the energy of the work and yet we've gotten into this weird cultural thing i think within the church you know you've got a whole group of people that just kind of leave because they've retired I, I just i don't know that's what i'm getting does that make sense am i am yeah. i articulating it Vinny? yeah i get it i get exactly what you're saying and it's it even came up a couple of years ago my grandpa passed away at 92 and my grandma came to stay with us for a couple of weeks and you know she was kind of down and out whatever you know i understand your husband you've been married to for 50 years died you're gonna be bummed out and so we were sitting out on the deck one night and i was smoking a cigar and and my grandma was hanging out out there and just kind of t- reminiscing old stories when we were kids and stuff. And she kind of ended with this kind of woe is me comment, like, I guess there's nothing for me to do now, so I might as well die. And I kind of made the point to her. I said, Grandma, I said, we got one job on this earth, and that's to reach souls for Jesus. So at 86 years old, if you think you can't do that anymore, then you just go downstairs and die in your rocking chair. And, dude, the life came back into her eyes. Like, nobody reminded her of that. Right. You know, this is our only purpose whether you're a pastor or a grandmother, uh, generations of grandchildren out there, those kids need Jesus. You know, they may not be getting it at home, but they may get it from grandma's house. So a hundred percent. Yeah. There's no retiring from that ever, whether you're a pastor or not, you know, it's how do we get it from your point? Yeah. Pastoral standpoint, you've been called by God to be a pastor. And I don't think you get to, uh, look up to heaven at 56 and be like, you know what? The bank account's looking pretty good. I'm out. Right. No, and th- th- there's been a lot of people that do that. Yep. Um, and it's like, well, wait a second. I, I have a king, and my race is, can, like, I, I know my race is done when I get called home. And then the sad fact that I'm realizing listening to car- compartmentalize this over there, I'm, like, sitting here, I'm like, unfortunately, we assume every pastor has got a calling from God, and some of them is just a business. Right. Mm. And that's the sad fact. So there is the retirement, so yes. to speak. Well, I think it, it doesn't just apply to pastors. It applies to Christians in general. Because, I mean, if you're retiring from being the church or being a Christian, you're basically retiring from being a father or a mother. Exactly. And, and you can't just retire from being <laughs> a, a, a parent. Mm-hmm. You, you know what I mean? Like, you, you're called as a Christian to, to like, basically mentor those younger Christians disciple them and and what are you doing if you just walk away from that for sure creighton why don't you drop your topic and we'll spend the second half of the show getting into that sounds good all right so uh last week we talked about um gosh dang i forgot what the actual topic was we were talking we were touching on uh the thief on the cross (laughs) we we derailed hard last week yeah last week we sure did yeah that's right (laughs) Um, But we talked about the thief on the cross and how he was going to heaven because Jesus said he was going to heaven. Um, And it made me think of uh, a argument that I've had only once or twice in my life, an actual argument, but I've had heard people talk about this a few different times. And that's the idea of the deathbed conversion and people who aren't Christians believing that a God who would allow a deathbed confession is a bad God. And I can explain that more if you need me to. Yeah. So, I mean, I get the whole concept of the, the deathbed confession. You, you kind of charged it with like, well, people will accuse that of being, you know, that that's a bad God. You're going to have to unpack that more. Okay. Um, so as people like to do in semantic arguments, they use extremes. Um, and so one of the extremes that I've heard is uh, somebody will be, somebody will say, so you believe in a God who, if at the end of World War II, Hitler gave his life to Christ, he would go to heaven and get to live in paradise forever after giving, killing 12 million people. They would say, I can't believe in a God who would be able to do that. They, can, they say that they can't believe in a God who would be able to give, forgive Hitler just because he prayed a prayer at the end of his life and forgive him for all of the horrible things he did up to that point without him having to do anything prior to dying other than pray a prayer that it, that would be the uh, gotcha yeah the you know the extreme version of the argument to make the point well so so the idea of a deathbed confession there's several different angles that we can go at uh, with this particular topic that I think are, are relevant and important and really not talked about enough um, I think that there's a lot of conf- confusion to this first let's let's get uh, one point out of the way is it possible? Like, is it possible at the end of your life 
um, dis- despite the fact that you've spent your entire life rejecting the Lord, resisting Jesus, uh, rejecting the Holy Spirit's work in your life, the drawing, the leading, the conviction, um, is it possible, is it even possible that, that a person in that dynamic um, on their deathbed can come to this realization that Jesus is a savior, that they can be forgiven for their sins, accept Christ, be saved, and go to heaven and not hell. Mm-hmm. Is that possible? Like, let's address that. And so we got to go to the scriptures for the answer to that. And the answer is, is unequivocally yes, because we have a very stark example of that in the thief on the cross. Again, a man who was guilty, even by his own admission. I think it's in Luke 19. He, he makes the comment to the other, th- you know, the other thief that's taunting Jesus. He says, he says, hey, <laughs> you and I, bucko, like we're guilty. Like this is, this is the just punishment for our crimes. Like the man acknowledged his sin, his guilt, and his judgment. And then he says, but this man is clearly innocent. So he acknowledges Jesus' sinlessness and his innocence. And then, and then he places his faith in Jesus. There at the, there's nothing the man can do. His hands and his, are, are nailed to a tree. There's no place he can go. His feet are nailed to a tree. He is going to die. No work can save him. Only faith can save him, which is the only thing that saves any of us. And he places his faith in Jesus, and he says, will you save me? And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. So we have an example in the scriptures of a deathbed confession, and and, and it's validated by Jesus himself, which is a pretty good authority. You know, So Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise, um, I think we can take Jesus at his word that the man was indeed saved. So we have to at least set aside the debate as to whether or not it can happen. Because it can, right? So, so now we have, to, we have to, to deal with the ramifications of that. Um, the second thing I would add, and you guys put some thoughts together as, as I'm going through this uh, to help unpack it. Um, it is a semantic argument. What's interesting is do we have any other examples of this occurring, the deathbed confession, um, in the scriptures? Is there another example of this at all? Um, and, and again, someone that's listening to this or watching this can, can drop a note. I'm not familiar with any of them. Uh, I don't see any other uh, what we would classify as deathbed confessions. Now, do, do we see people in, in older life, in older years, uh, repent, change, etc. Sure, there are examples of that. But the 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 topic at hand is the deathbed confession. Uh, the thief on the cross, to my understanding, is the only example of that. Now, I need to add about the, that that example. Uh, there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot we don't know about that guy. Um, we don't we we know he's Jewish, um, which means he had a religious upbringing. So he's had exposure to the word of God. Uh, we don't know how much conviction has existed in his life. We don't know what steps had been taken. We get a glimpse into that guy's life at the end of his journey. We don't know the journey that leads up to that point. Now, we do know that there was sin, there was rebellion, there was some wickedness. Again, he affirms his own guilt. But there's something about Jesus that this man recognizes and, 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 and connects for him at the moment. One thief doesn't. He does. So my, my point, and this is this is the secondary juncture, it's rare. And people do throw it as a semantic argument to which I would say, okay, you're talking about Nazis or Hitler. Well, is, do you have any evidence that Hitler did that? No. So why are we talking about Hitler? Right. You know, or Mao. Do, we, do you have an example that Mao, like, so... Like, let's not speak in the realm of hyperbole or hypothetical. Give me an example. Like, point out somebody that you know that gave their life to Jesus on their deathbed. 
And what you're going to run into is that that person very likely has no actual example because I think it is a semantic argument. We only have one record in scripture of this, the thief on the cross. And then you get into like, how many people do you know? I don't know a lot. I mean, I've heard their stories, anecdotal stories. I don't know anyone personally. You guys know anyone personally that on their deathbed gave their life to Jesus. Mm -mm. So what we're talking about is something that's very, very rare. Now, let's assume that it does happen because we have an example of it. Like, what would necessitate it happening? Um, obviously, a work of God. Obviously, it's a rare thing. And that the majority of people that are on their deathbed don't convert. Why? Because they're, they're hardened in their rebellion against God. And we see more evidence that the longer you go rejecting Jesus, Paul talks about you sear your own conscience. Like there's really crazy statistics about, you know, when people give their life to the Lord and the percentage decrease. Like, again, this was an old youth pastor statistic, and and I, I don't even know how accurate it is at this point. But it was something like if someone doesn't give their life to Jesus by the age of 18, like the percentage of them giving their life to the Lord after 18 drops like 80%. Like, it's a significant decrease, um, which is why children's ministry is so important. It's why, like, train up a child in the way that they should go. Like, it's not about, like, indoctrination, but it's about, it's about reaching someone with Jesus before they've rebelled enough against Jesus that they begin to sear their own conscience. Um, I think it's a beautiful thing when older people end up coming to that realization, give their life to the Lord. I've known several of them. Again, that's a very rare thing, though, because a lot of the times, uh, the longer you go, again, rejecting the Holy Spirit, rejecting Jesus, it doesn't mean he gives up on you. But again, the Bible is very clear over and over and over again that because you'll be held accountable for the amount of revelation you reject, at some point, the amount of revelation you receive begins to wane. And again, that's an act of God's mercy. So we get into the deathbed confession. Like for someone to be in that position, going back to Hitler, was hit, would Hitler even be able to make that decision at that point? Well, if you look at his life and you look at everything that had happened in his life, um, we're, we're talking about, a, it, it's a non-starter. Like there's no evidence that, that that's even a possibility at that point that that would, that that would even occur. Now, again, you go back to the thief in the cross. Obviously, something else had been going on. And you get to the few examples, you'll often find that there was a lot of revelation. And, and, and there were people in their life that were consistently witnessing and consistently ministering. Or it was a nurse that came in. Or they started feeling hell. You hear those stories, you know. And then they cry out to Jesus. And Jesus saves them. So, first point, it's possible. Second point, is rare. And... And it's rare because of the way that the human soul works in context of the revelation of God. The longer we go rejecting God, the less revelation we get, the lower our percentage of, of, of it ever happening, you know. Like it's a small percentage, and that's why. That makes sense? Yes. Mm-hmm. The, the third point that I think is, is, is important to it is, is the core concept. And this gets to the essence of the, 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 the critic's question of bringing the topic up is because it goes back to like, well, how is God just then? Mm -hmm. And what we do know about God is he's absolutely just. It's part of his nature. He is just, which is why sin, sin sin isn't forgiven willy nilly. Like no sinner escapes the judgment of God. It just so happens that instead of you taking the judgment of God, Jesus took it for you. But don't mistake, the judgment of God for your sin was poured out and met and satisfied. So no one gets out of this without there being a punishment. Now, it's just whether you're going to carry it or the sinless, perfect Jesus carried it for you. But the wrath of God is satisfied for your sin one way or the other because God is just. He's just. So when we talk about the forgiveness, it's not as though God's like, hey, I'm going to... Will you forgive my sin? I forgive your sin. Come up to heaven. Like, like that there was n- no payment made. That would be not, that would be unjust. But a payment was made. Again, we're placing our faith in Jesus. 
We're placing our faith in his work on the cross on our behalf that it was my sin he bore. So there is a fundamental idea of justice when it comes to God. So the deathbed confession. So, so okay, I gave my life to the Lord when I was like seven years old, five, six, seven years old. Um, what that means is that my sin, past, present, and future, was all forgiven. Okay? Mm-hmm. So what's the difference between that conversion and a deathbed conversion? Because while I got saved young, so my past sin were small, there's a lot of sin in my future, equally forgiven. The deathbed confession, there's very little sin in the future. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all backloaded. But guess what? We, we all live a lifetime of sin. So when we're talking about the measuring out of justice, it still gets measured out on the cross, which makes it just. Because it's the payment of a life of sin. Even though I've been bought by the blood of Christ and I, I'm seeking to walk, does, am I sinless? No. Positionally, I am. Practically, I'm, I'm not. Can confirm. So there's this application that, again, my sin, past, present, and future, sin is forgiven, and, and I'm washed clean. Whether you do that at the beginning of your life or the end of your life. Now, we talk about justice. And I think that this really probably addresses more the, the angle of the, the skeptic's question. Um, I absolutely believe, and again, we could go through the scripture, we could establish this idea. Um, if someone wants to send an email, I'll send you the, the background for this, but... There absolutely seems to be the idea of a tiered level of, of punishment in hell. Um, like Dante's Inferno? I, I, I won't. To, to a degree. Okay. That there are, that, that we, again, will receive judgment according to our wicked deeds. The, the Bible teaches that. that. That we receive according, because God is just. So God doesn't punish in hell um, the good moral person that just never gave their life to Jesus on the same level as the Hitler who exterminated 6 million Jews or the Stalin who killed millions and millions of people or whatnot. There are levels of punishment within hell based upon your wickedness and your evil deeds. It's all hell, so it ain't good. So, so don't misunderstand. Don't bank on your good deeds. But there is but so but there is an application of God's justice in the measuring of his judgment for sin. Okay? So there is that that framework that does exist when we talk about hell. I think the same concept is also applicable in the way that God judges our good deeds. Um, there is a plethora of of passages of scripture that present um, this application that we get rewarded in heaven based upon our good deeds. Now, the guy on the deathbed, how many righteous deeds does he have? Very few because he lived a life of sin. He's made righteous at the end, but how, how much work has he been able to do in response to God's grace? Like, what his life, yes, saved, has it edified? Has it been a blessing? Has it been used by the hands of the master? No. You lived a life of rebellion, a, a life of rejection. Yes, you're in heaven, but how much reward are you getting? You're in heaven, but it's going to be measured accordingly, which is why I would really encourage people not to wait to the end of your life to give your life to Jesus, but do it at the beginning. So I think... The, the way that judgment is carried out is proportional because it's just and reward is, is equally so. Now, heaven will be heaven. I think it's C.S. Lewis that talks about that a good way of thinking about it is that the life that we lived creates for us the vessel of experience so that when we get to heaven, everyone will experience heaven and, and, and in an incredible way. Like, no one will lack in heaven. Heaven will be heaven for everyone. But will heaven be better for some than others? Not for them individually, but in comparison, probably so. Again, if, if, if I spend my life 
and I and I'm a bigger vessel, heaven will fill it more. My experience will be deeper unless I'm a little shot glass. I will still be filled. It will be a full experience, but it won't be the same that there's that there will be a proportionality to the way in which we experience are able to experience heaven. And that, that same idea can be applied to hell. Again, that entire idea filters into the core concept of justice. So when someone's like, well, hey, um, I spent my whole life following Jesus. Man, I suffered and I counted it joy for loss and et cetera. Um, so this is going to be the same as the guy that just lived for himself the whole time? And at the very end was like, Lord, save me. And he saved. So what's the, like, how is that just? Well, I would say that you are, because of the way that you lived your life, your, your capacity for the experience of heaven, it will be different than the other person. You'll both be in heaven. And then I can also say, if we want to carry it forth, when you start getting into the application of our jobs in the kingdom, because we got to remember, so we're going to live this life. Death is not the end. We're going to go to heaven for a period of time. We're going to be chilling out. At some, at some point, the whole church will join us in the rapture. We'll be having a party for about seven years while this place goes to pot. And we ride back to this earth with Jesus after we've died. I know that's crazy, but that's what the Bible teaches. You'll die. But then there will be the day that you'll come back to this very earth with Jesus, and you will have a job in that kingdom. Your job in that kingdom will be predicated upon, again, Jesus taught the, the parable where he, uh, you know, the king gave talents to three men, five, two, one, or whatever the number was. And talents would be money of some kind, not ten, like I think it was 10, five, good at one. And it, and it was, and, and it was all, it was measured, like it was a different application to each person that the king gave accordingly. And then when the king returned, the result of that, the return, was determined upon faithfulness. So the guy that had 10, because he was faithful, it doubled. He had 10 more. The guy that had five, it doubled. It was five, still less than the other guy. But in the, it was the one guy that didn't do anything, you know, where he actually calls him evil and a wicked servant. So within the kingdom itself, and that's Jesus talking about the kingdom, is you know, the, the life that we live here, um, does have an effect of the life that we will live when we come back here and the role that we'll have in the kingdom. Now, again, you'll be in the kingdom, so that's awesome. I'd rather be a janitor in the kingdom than the I king of hell. hell. But you don't have to be the janitor of the kingdom. You could be an administrator. You could, you could have a different role. The surveyor of the land, you know. The, the archaeologist, wine, the wine you know, taster, would mind you that know. job. <laughs> you're you're the Porta John worker, so so I'm just saying that when people bring up the idea of well the deathbed conversion, how is that how does that just? Uh, they're not placing the they're not placing it into the totality of the implications of waiting to the end of your life to give your life to Jesus. Does it get you to heaven? Sure. Does it does it get you like? Will you have wished immediately that you had given your life to Jesus sooner? Oh, for sure. And you you run into people, older saints, you know, you know, people that give their life to the Lord later in life. And almost universally, what do they say? Wish I, they had done it sooner. I can't believe I waited so long. I, I think a lot of people that present that argument have a very finite view of the world and everything. Uh, just we we're talking about the a finite like, view of uh, an uh, understanding uh, uh, of scripture too. Yeah, uh, not just a scripture, and I find uh, most people that present that view are, are not Christians. And, and you kind of go back to what we we're talking about uh, last week with Vinny and 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 talking about it, where the his friend presented that uh, theoretical. Uh, oh yeah, 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 thing yeah, yeah. That he's like, what would you do if I killed your your wife and family? And he'd be like, well, I'd spend the rest of my life trying to get you to come to Jesus. Like, that's that's a, a, an infinite view rather than a finite view of, of of time and space. And I think that's where we get mixed up. Is 
you're looking at at everything from a very narrow time frame of average of 60 years. What's the average death? death rate in the 60 US. to 80, 60 years, 80, is 80 a blip. years you know and, and and we're talking about eternity yeah and, and you're talking about <laughs> from the very beginning of time to the end of time and beyond that and and you're talking about whether hitler got saved on this deathbed or not and and that's not the point we're talking about a soul who's eternal and so that 80 years, 60 years, or even 20 years on the deathbed is nothing compared to the millions and thousands of years that they're going to have either in heaven or hell. And, and so I think that's what we got to look at is, and, and that's, I, in my opinion, yeah. that's a better argument is you're talking about this time frame, which is, a, 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 like you said, a blip <laughs> in the in your actual lifespan because, you know, like C.S. Lewis said, we're, we're, we're a uh, amphibious being, basically. Of of soul and spirit and, and body and we move between we're an infinite and we're we're immortal and mortal at the same time and and immortality is is what we need to talk about and focus on and so if Hitler or if Mao Zedong or if Stalin got saved on their deathbed who are you to say that's just or unjust? Well, it's, it's the, the ecclesiastical argument. So, like, you go to the book of Ecclesiastes, and S- Solomon is dealing with big issues, right? Right. But you have the consistent refrain. Uh, you know, I search for, like, under the sun, under the sun. It was all under the sun. Um, vanity of vanities. You know, he, he's, he's, but he's looking for, he's looking for eternal answers to, to physical, practical, temporary, temporary, uh, questions under the sun. And then has the grand conclusion at the end is I had to look beyond the sun, uh, fear God, obey his commandments. You know what I mean? Like, right. like the ultimate, when you, when you have these conversations, um, when the skeptic comes, it's, it's like you're saying, it is important to be like, well, Hey, listen, you're looking at this, this whole idea from a very narrow vantage point. That's going to be very difficult for you to understand any, any of the answers to this, because we got to take a step beyond that outside of we got to look at this above the sun because the at eternal. that because at that point if 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 god is a just god and he is allowing these guys to be saved on their deathbed then that is pure justice and that's pure love but if he is just nothing but just and then we're all for lack of a better term, screwed. Because I mean, we we it, it doesn't matter whether it's on the deathbed or when you're you're born instantly, like it. it it's, yeah, you know, it, you, you see what? Oh, I'm for sure. Saying? No, that brings yeah. up that, that brings up a great counter right. question. So so someone brings up the deathbed conversion. I just don't believe a, a just God would allow a deathbed conversion. The, the the appropriate answer is like, I have a hard time understanding how a just God allows any conversion at any point <laughs> because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None are good, no, not one. You're talking about the deathbed. Like, I don't get that. What about you right now? Right. What it takes for God to forgive you right now? Let's talk about that. And that's, that's the, the better answer. Most skeptics, like these people that are posing these questions, like these ridiculous questions like Hitler or one that I was hit with. Uh, if Do you believe that somebody that commits child adultery, you know, rape of children their entire lives and then at the end of their life, you know, those kids that they raped – find Jesus and then that guy finds Jesus and you think he's going to be in heaven with those kids right. absolutely he is absolutely but and then it was thrown in my face well I was that kid well you know what once you right now your heart is filled with hate for that person once you accept Jesus in your heart you will no longer have that hate you won't even understand these feelings that you're feeling now once you have Jesus in your heart and that's the hard thing is you've got a, a heart filled with hate asking us to condemn the person they're angry with so they got to step back into themselves and realize that once you find Jesus, you will know you will pray and hope that person that raped you as a child and, will find Jesus. And, like, and the, the counter argument, I, I completely agree with that. The counter argument is that it's the, the question is rooted in a complete lack of understanding their own unworthiness and depravity yeah. because it's like, well, that guy, how can that guy go to heaven? How do you go to heaven? That's the that's yeah. Well, <laughs> well what about you? <laughs> yes, like you, you, like you, you are so focused on 
I just don't get how that guy implying because I I'm good enough, but that guy shouldn't be. And it's like, well, wait a second. You, you've, you've, you've lost touch of the reality of who you are and your sin. And I think that's what boils down to even like these, these arguments is they're comparing themselves to other people instead of a righteous, pure, perfect God. And I'll, I was talking to a, a guy at work uh, the other day um, who's not a Christian. He's religious. Um, oh, yeah. Mm. And I was like, well, how do you get to heaven? If the standard, and I go, the standard of getting into heaven is perfection. How do we get there? He's like, I don't know. And, and that that's, that's the thing. The standard is perfection. I think that's why those conversations always take the form of Hitler or the long-term lifetime child molester. Yeah. Or, you know, the repeat DUI drunk driver who killed a family of nine um, I think that's why, because it's really easy to be like, yeah, obviously your God's not going to let Hitler in, but I should get in. Right. Because You're it's still really not easy to, <laughs> I look really good if you put me next to Hitler. Still not perfect. Right. <laughs> the, the, you know, I've never, I've never tried this approach, but like, so someone says, you know, Hey, you know, if Hitler gave his life to the Lord on their, on his deathbed. You know, would God forgive him? I don't. I don't understand why God would forgive him. Okay. Um, let's. Let me ask you. Um, if you decide on your deathbed to give your life to Jesus, do you want him to forgive you or not? Like, let's just talk about you. Mm-hmm. Because because obviously the answer would be yeah, I would. But well, wait a second. Why? Why? Wait. <laughs> why? See if we in, if we personalize it, and, and I think that again, if we're if we're looking for like an, an underpinning of the conversation that maybe is deeper than the actual topic, when you get these type of questions as Christians, um, you can address the, the the you can address the question, you can unpack the question, but at some point you've got to pivot it to the person itself. Because because you gotta you've gotta get them to think about themselves. Because they're asking about somebody else. And they're doing that to have a conversation, theoretical conversation, about somebody else, often to avoid having a conversation about themselves. And so I think in any type of evangelistic uh, interaction make Jesus personal. Try to try to bring it home to them. Cause ultimately they're not gonna be able to understand that. They're not going to be a, have a full concept of eternity, whether that be heaven or hell, without the Holy Spirit being present in their life. Yeah. And, and I think that's what it boils down to. So I, I, if somebody asks you that question, it, it you got to pivot back to them instead of them <laughs> distracting you. It's almost it's almost like, hey, uh, if Hitler died, you know, right beforehand, he gave his life to Jesus. Uh, I just don't understand how that's possible. And your answer should be like, okay. The only way that this is going to really work out for you to get this is why not right now you give your life to Jesus. Like, let me introduce you to Jesus first. <laughs> let me, let me help you meet Jesus. Uh, let me, let me help you experience his forgiveness and, and, and his Holy spirit. Because I think if you experience, if you meet Jesus, you'll know the answer. Yeah, your question is no longer valid. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, let's just skip. Let's just, like, you know, the easiest yeah. way for me to explain how God can do this is just let me introduce you to Jesus. Him because it. he's got the answer. Because, because, <laughs> because you won't be asking that question anymore exactly. because of the weight of just God's grace and his forgiveness washing over you. It's like, now well, you understand grace. Through now faith. I get it. But, okay. And, and right. Tell, you know? And I tell you what, like, I, I've lived in, it, it, we, we were talking about Mao Zedong. I've lived there. I've seen what uh, I traveled to Cambodia, and it, they in Cambodia they built this tower of human skulls and bones, showing what the communists did, and it makes you angry at how evil humans can be. But at the same time, knowing what hell is, it scares me that even those evil people are going to go to hell. Mm. Yeah, you see what I'm saying. Yeah, and I don't think any. I don't think a non-Christian can understand what that's like to, 
to look at evil and the evil person in the face and not think, yeah, I want justice, but man, you don't want the justice that's coming. Mm-hmm. Right. Any any final thoughts? You guys got anything else, Creighton? What do you, what do you think? That was a, I thought that your was topic. Great. You hit on all the top all the points I wanted you to hit on. I very much enjoyed it. So give yes. uh, give the audience just a kind of a quick update. I, I do know that the video, yeah, Vimeo, uh, died switch on the us. camera to you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter. They can't actually see the camera. Oh, they can't actually see the camera. So um, it doesn't matter. Hi all. Um, yeah, Vimeo died. I will get the podcast up tomorrow night. Title of it will be uh, Did Hitler well. Go to Heaven? Did Hitler Go to Heaven? I actually love that. That's what we're doing. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll get the video up to tomorrow as well as the podcast. Uh, sorry, guys. All right. Well, you've been listening, watching the Outlaw Radio Show. Again, uh, we had video issues uh, this evening. Uh, the platform that we use to, to propagate out the live stream uh, crashed on us. We don't know why. We'll figure that out. Um, but the audio has been recorded. The video has been recorded. So the audio will be released tomorrow on our podcast. So if you're if you're watching eventually, check out the podcast, Apple, Google, Spotify. Um, uh, if you're listening, the video will be posted probably Friday would be my guess. So you can go back and, and watch. So thank you so much for listening. God bless. See you guys next Wednesday.